Welcome to Get Naked with Dr. Kate. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri, a Beverly Hills-based psychologist, certified sex therapist, and the founder of Modern Intimacy. Thanks for joining me here where I talk about sex, relationships, mental health, and dive into your questions with practical answers and real solutions. Each week, I share insights aimed at helping you build an authentic and healthy relationship with yourself, with others, and with your sexuality. It's time to get naked, emotionally, mentally, and on your own time, physically. Chris, thanks so much for being here today. I've been really excited to talk with you about sexual narcissism. You know, you and I go back and forth a lot in our DMs talking about different phenomena that we observe. And on your podcast, Diary of an Empath, you are so great at honing in on how to recognize all different kinds of narcissism. So let's break it down and get started. How does sexual narcissism differ from a narcissistic personality disorder? So thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm super excited. We've been connected for a long time and I'm just excited to have this conversation with you and connect with your audience. So I wanna be very clear that we hear this term narcissist in social media all the time. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you guys are wrong. There could be a lot of people that you are in relationships with that are really narcissists. They probably have true narcissistic personality disorder, but it doesn't mean that everybody is a narcissist. Everyone has narcissistic traits. It mm -hmm. is a survival mechanism. When you hear your name, technically that could be a narcissistic trait. We have to have a sense of self in order to recognize that. It's a survival mechanism that goes back to our ancient brains. So mm -hmm. we all have those traits to a certain extent. But when you're talking about sexual narcissism, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person is a narcissist. They could be, but maybe they have certain traits within their own sexual identity or their sexual expression that may point to a little bit higher narcissist trait on the narcissist scale if we're looking at it like on a scale. And so what can that look like? Because we hear those terms and when I think of a narcissist, my brain automatically goes to a selfish person that only thinks of themselves. And mm -hmm. yes, that could totally be a part of what it is. But when it's sexual narcissism, it could come across in so many different ways. And that might look like maybe they're focusing on their own needs when it comes to their sexual needs. Perhaps when you are having sex with that partner, with that person, your needs are not met. They may come through with, um, if you bring it up as an issue, instead of it being looked at as feedback, they may look at it as criticism. Mm. In some instances, it may come up as a lack of empathy. So, you know, I think in a, in a healthy relationship, if you were to come to your partner and say, I have some needs that are not being met. I'm not achieving orgasm. I feel like there's a lack of intimacy. And I think in a good, healthy partnership, that partner should be able to say, okay, well, what do I need to do in order to meet my partner's needs and vice versa? And somebody who has a high skill of sexual narcissism is not going to have a lot of empathy for their partner, and they're mm -hmm. going to be more focused on their own needs. And sometimes with that, we may find that someone who has that sexual narcissism also may focus more on the sexual act itself and not so much of the emotional intimacy because that piece of emotional intimacy might be missing and it could be for a variety of different reasons you know sometimes it's a, a sense of control and that control can come out for so many different reasons whether it's trauma in their past or a need to be in control of the situation and Sometimes when you have an emotional connection or an emotional intimacy with somebody, it can be threatening. It could be a sense of you're a threat. This is a threat to my emotional health. So let me shut off and let me only focus on the physical act. Mm -hmm. Sometimes narcissism can look like withholding. And withholding is really tricky because I don't think we often think about that when it comes mm -hmm. to um, a sense of control. But there are times when somebody may withhold sex to use it as a sense of manipulation or a sense of control within that dynamic. 
Ah, uh, well, I can imagine there are a lot of people feeling super validated hearing you say that, but I'm going to push back a little bit because I don't think we can actually withhold sex because withholding sex means that someone else is entitled to it. And I think that's a, a, a nuance, um, but I want to just really highlight that what I hear you saying is that people might weaponize sex, right? They might kind of use it as a baiting strategy and then pull back intentionally, as opposed to somebody who might not be interested in having sex because they don't feel seen or valued or validated. And, and they're not really feeling very um, amorous or in, in a moment of desire. Is, am I Correct. hearing you right? Yeah. And you, and, and thank you. You really you really worded that in a, in a great way. And that, that key word there is weaponizing. Because I think the difference here is the the, the lack of empathy and manipulation. Yeah. When you're thinking of, you know, narcissistic traits really high on that narcissist scale, it's somebody who's going to use manipulation as a tactic to get what they need or to get their needs met. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because so somebody with a narcissistic organization in, in terms of like their personality or a narcissistic personality disorder, these traits are sort of ubiquitous across lots of domains of their life and their personality. But with somebody who exhibits sexual narcissism, if I'm hearing you right, this kind of behavior of egocentrism is really limited to the sexual domain of their lives. Is that what, is that the difference? Yeah, I think so. And I th I think too, you know, there's so many things to take into consideration with, you know, culture, with how somebody grew up. Do they have trauma? Do they not have trauma? And, you know, I think that when we're talking about somebody who has trauma, that can come out in so many different ways. I know that we're, that's going off topic, but sometimes people can use sex as a way of weaponizing, but there are some people who may not want to engage in an emotional connection for other reasons. It doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. mean that it's manipulative. But when we're talking about narcissism, it is a direct line of weaponization of doing this to get their own needs met with a lack of empathy. Yeah. When I think of narcissism, the image that comes to mind a lot is the Wizard of Oz, right? I'm not alone in this analogy. It's such a great depiction of somebody who's feeling incredibly insecure, broadcasting this really big, you know, larger than life image of themselves. And with sexual narcissism, it's very similar. There might be evidence of this like grandiosity and it might look like somebody's really confident sexually or has really high se uh, sexual self-esteem. But in reality, somebody who is exhibiting sexual narcissism is likely really anxious about sex and mm -hmm. <clears throat> really afraid of being poorly evaluated when it comes to their sexual performance or the experience of their partner. And so that really what ends up happening for them is they sort of skip over the vulnerability of having those harder conversations and learning different sexual skills and kind of being willing to have things not go the best way. And they jump into a place of being self-serving and taking care of their yes. needs. And that sort of serves this fantasy for them of, if I like it, if it's good for me, then it's great, right? And That's it right. must be great for you. And I think that that really speaks to a tendency um, of those folks to kind of regulate themselves, externally regulate with, with another person so it's not mutual. It's not like co-regulation, which we see is really healthy, but external regulation is like when somebody kind of uses another person as an object to regulate themselves. I think mm -hmm. this really shows up in a sexually narcissistic pattern because mm -hmm. these folks at first really seem like they're super complimentary and like they're really sexually generous, but it's a baiting strategy yes. to shift the focus back onto them. So like a lot of the things that we might see in a narcissistic pattern of behavior in relationships, we'll also see in sex. There's sort of that hooking, um, devaluing, uh, lots of just like using the other person in their mind and sometimes sexually to have an experience that bolsters their sense of self-esteem. Yeah. So we've heard the term love bombing. I'm sure a lot of you have. Um, and so just like, um, Kate, you were just saying a lot of those same strategies that we see with uh, relationships with narcissistic personality disorder can come out in sexual relationships, too, when you're dealing with somebody who has NPD or high on the narcissist scale. So 
love bombing, we hear it, right? It, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're flooding you with love. They're trying to get you hooked. And slowly that devaluation de- phase starts. And that can come out in sex too. So maybe in the beginning, it can look like really being attentive to your needs, really trying to please you and be passionate. And slowly that devaluation de- of that needs being shifted to that person, mm-hmm. that grandiosity that becomes to be more inflated. And then it's hard because th- when you're having sex with somebody, your brain is releasing all of these chemicals like oxytocin and serotonin, all these love and feel good hormones. And so when you're having sex with somebody, you know, t- studies show that when you have sex with somebody after so long, you are going to develop some type of feelings for them at some point. I think it's just natural human nature. There's some type of emotional connection that's going to happen. And so if you're being intimate with somebody after over time and that shift is changing from an emotional intimate connection to strictly uh, the other person's needs it can be really difficult to then step away from the relationship or to really have a clear head and evaluate if this is something you want to continue because if somebody is giving you all of this love and they're giving you this intimacy and then all of a sudden it's being pulled back, it can be very, very confusing, mm-hmm. especially if that cycle is kind of dangling the carrot, taking it away, dangling the carrot, taking it away. And I think mm-hmm. that can also come out in sexual relationships, too. Yeah. Well, is it always really overt when you're with somebody who's exhibiting sexual narcissism or can it be really subtle, too? I think with any type of narcissism, it can be very subtle. And that covert narcissism, I think, is the most confusing and the Mm. most hurtful out of all of them because it happens so subtly in different ways that it's almost like you don't see it coming until it's there. Mm -hmm. And what's difficult, too, and from what I've seen, even my own personal life and even with some of my clients, is that when, when there's a communication or a dialogue that's trying to be brought up to address it, they tend to get gaslit or Mm -hmm. to think that it's on them or they're going crazy or you're the one being selfish. And it really makes you question, is it me? Or, you know, is there a real problem? And that's where that covert subtleness can really be damaging Mm -hmm. because it happens very, very slowly over time and maybe little covert ways. And um, whereas like if somebody was just out the door, selfish in bed and selfish in other areas of the relationship, of course, you're not going to continue. Most of the time we're going to know, we're going to be like, no, I'm not going to deal with that. But when it happens slowly over time, it makes it really difficult to just leave the relationship or leave the dialogue. Yeah, it's so insidious and so intermittent. It really can be incredibly confusing for people when they don't know what to make of it, especially if it's so intermittent that it's uh, peppered with lots of really interesting or seemingly connective moments, right? Then Mm -hmm. it's like the mask drops for just a quick second and you see a hint of someone's narcissism or their egocentrism in those moments. And it's like, whoa, what did I just witness? That can't be real, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, mm-hmm. even in my own experience, I've, I've been in situations and I remember one situation in particular where I was involved with um, a guy who I was interested in. And at first the emotional connection was really strong. And I thought this was a very intimate, very passionate person. And then I started noticing the weaponization that was happening with the sex Mm. or I don't want to have sex. I think we should wait. And at first, of course, my mind goes to, oh, maybe this person really wants to get to know me. But over time, I started to see that, no, this was a way that this person was trying to maintain control over Mm -hmm. the situation and the connection that we had. And then when it came to the actual act of sex itself, all of the the pleasure was on this person. But then when I would bring something up to say, hey, this is really bothering me, I would get a little hint of it. So maybe one time I would get the emotional intimacy or the Mm -hmm. focus being on me. And then it would always divert back as soon as the connection was reestablished. And so it was kind of like that circle of back and forth, back and forth and manipulation that was used. And it, it's very confusing. It gets to the point where it's like, okay, is this, is it me? Does this person just really not want to engage in sex? But then when they do engage in sex, they're, you know, they're all in it. This is, it's very confusing for the other person, especially if the other person's highly sensitive or somebody who's very connected emotionally. 
Yeah. <clears throat> in those scenarios, I mean, the long-term effects of being with somebody who is sexually narcissistic can look a lot like being some being with someone who has a narcissistic personality disorder. It can erode people's self-esteem. It can create um, feelings of anxiety or depression. It can engender experiences of being or feeling sexually traumatized as well. I mean, when your sexual needs are dismissed so frequently or so and seen as so unnecessary in the mm -hmm. pleasure landscape of the partnership, it can really create for a lot of people deep questions about their worthiness in the relationship. Especially if you're already somebody who questioned that before the relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and I say that because even somebody just like myself, not just my clients, but, you know, I always use myself as a personal story because I'm human mm -hmm. and I can really relate with a lot of these topics. I went into relationships with a really distorted sense of self because of my own traumatic history and my own trauma. And so because I didn't do a lot of that processing and that healing and going into these relationships, not really fully understanding who I was in my own identity, my sexual identity and how I viewed my sexuality was, I don't want to say the word broken, but it was very distorted. So when I went through this sexual narcissism with this partner, it really damaged my self-esteem because the way that I viewed myself was that my sexuality was my power because that's how mm -hmm. I grew up. I grew up only having control through my sexuality. So now that I started to lose that control in my own relationship, it's like, who am I? Okay, if I, if I don't have a sense of control, even in the bedroom, I don't know if I have a sense of control in this relationship. And that in itself really did damage. And the hard part is, is because some, this person in particular, and some people who really use sexuality as a way to have a, have a sense of control, it, it took that control away from me so much that it was weaponized and it was used mm -hmm. as a way to manipulate me and to control the relationship. And I think that's where it can do the most damage for people. It can be really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it can. It can be so hard to come back from that. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Thanks. Yeah. How, how did you or how do you um, advise folks to move on when they recognize that someone that they're with has been exhibiting sexual narcissism? Like what's the path to even recognizing it, trying to navigate it within a relationship and recognizing, you know what, I got to go. Right. I think the first things first, okay, communication, right? You can't control how the other person mm -hmm. communicates with you. You can only control how you communicate. But sometimes I think that we, we tend to think that our partner is a mind reader. Like it should just be on the floor. They should know what my needs are. They should know how to please me. They should know that this is a problem. And that's not always the case. We can't always just assume like, oh, my partner's just selfish. They have no empathy you have to communicate a need first. And of course, if you communicate a need, this is a conversation that has gotten brought up and they're not receptive to communicating, then obviously there's a bigger problem. But I think there are some situations where somebody truly may just not know that there's a problem. And sometimes those can be fixed if you have two willing parties that are willing to meet each other in the middle, listen to each other's needs and act on those, those needs and those desires. But in situations where a partner is not receptive, they're mm -hmm. not empathetic, they continue to show patterns of weaponization or lack of empathy or not meeting your needs. I think in those cases, you really have to get honest with yourself. Is this something that I can continue to, to deal with? Is this narcissism coming out in other areas of the relationship as well? Is it just sex? I always say that finding a sex therapist and somebody who specializes in sex therapy, such as yourself, mm -hmm. is really beneficial. However, I know I'm going to not everybody's going to agree with me when I say this, but I truly feel like if you're dealing some, but with somebody who has true narcissistic personality disorder, it's really, really hard. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it's really difficult, even with therapy, to really set a, a healthy foundational relationship that's based off of trust and safety. 
because for a lot of us, we need to feel safe in a relationship to really explore our sexuality and to have our needs met. And if we don't have a base of safety and trust in the relationship, you're not going to be able to have a a fun, sexual, intimate, um, transforming experience with your partner. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's it's you have to get really honest with yourself, but it starts with your partner. You have to at least give them an opportunity to understand where you're coming from and what the problem is and then observe mm-hmm. and go from there. Yeah, I think I, I agree with what you're saying. It, it can be really difficult to be in partnership with someone who's not at all interested in your needs being met. And that is uh a hard place to live in a relationship. And a lot of people will try to change their partner and contort themselves through all kinds of mental gymnastics to try and get their partner to see their needs, value their needs, want to address their needs and create a space of mutuality. And depending on the level of acuity with a sexually narcissistic or non-sexually narcissistic organization, that's going to be really hard to do. And so in those dynamics, I think you have a couple of steps that you can take to really assess, is this a relationship that I can be happy in? Is it a relationship where I can get enough of my needs met? Um, And that may not be a black and white answer. So some of the things that I think are important to consider are things like really considering what are your sexual needs? Do you have a good sense of what you're actually asking for? um, And what would feel like mutuality? Some people do, some people don't. And it can be really hard to get an answer to that question in the heat of the moment. So I often recommend that people kind of slow down and in their own time, really get clear about what they're interested in, or if they don't know, what would they like to explore? And maybe that seems a little difficult to pin down. What don't you like, right? What are your limits? And maybe starting with the the, the things that you know are off the table for you and really making those limits clear with yourself first And then starting the conversation with your partner about what you're interested in exploring, where there's alignment and where there might not be, and setting those boundaries appropriately. It's really important when you're with a partner who isn't as motivated as you are to establish equity around pleasure, that you're practicing a lot of self-care and making sure that you prioritize yourself and you're building community with other people so that you don't fall into this well of uh, no one caring, right? Mm-hmm. So self-care, mm-hmm. things like journaling, movement in your body, even solo sex can be a way to counterbalance some of those needs not being met in your sexual partnership. But one of the things that comes up for me a lot, and I'd love your thoughts on this, caress. Um, When I'm working with folks, a lot of people will fawn in the moment. Um, So let's say, for example, the person they're with is is exhibiting sexually narcissistic behavior, and they're trying to do something that they want, but it's an unwanted behavior, right? Like something that's maybe more aggressive or more boastful, or they're really demanding a lot of praise. And they're not really considering what that experience is like, right, for the other person. A lot of people that I work with have talked about fawning in those moments and just sort of giving in and being like, yes, this is the best sex ever when it's not, or they fake an orgasm, um, or they tolerate things that don't feel good or feel too rough or aggressive. Um, And I think that there's a really protective mechanism in that fawning behavior right? It's, it's understandable that people would want to move through that and kind of go along with it. But I often think about how important it is that unless there's a safety issue and that's requiring that kind of behavior to move through it, <clears throat> not validating those behaviors can be really important feedback for mm-hmm. somebody. Because if, if you're playing along with the narcissism, it sort of feeds into this idea that it's okay for that person to continue engaging in sex with you in that way. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so two things that I I wrote down. Um, One in particular, ladies, please stop faking your orgasm because (laughs) you are teaching someone how to show up for you. And 
I, I think unfortunately, and you know, porn's another topic, but I think that porn has opened up, and there's nothing wrong with porn I, if it's ethical, for in my opinion. But you know, porn has opened up this door with teaching men and women how to be in the bedroom. It's more of an act, more of a, a show instead of mm -hmm. actually focusing on what's pleasurable. And so when you're faking an orgasm, you're teaching your partner how to show up for you, but you're teaching them in a way that's not pleasurable for you. And I think that feedback can be uncomfortable sometimes. I mean, this can go back from childhood. If, if we were kids and we went to mom and dad and said, hey, this is my opinion or this is what I want. And we were taught or punished for speaking up. It may be difficult to give feedback in such a emotional and vulnerable moment, such as sex and intimacy. So feedback might be really difficult for some, and it may just feel more safe to just be quiet and to fake an orgasm and get it done with in order to keep that intimacy and to keep that bond. There's kind of like this, this, um, not desperation, but this really, really strong hold. And I want to keep the bond that we have. I want to keep some type of intimacy with this person. So by faking an orgasm or by acting as though this is pleasurable for me, I'm keeping some type of connection. Because if I speak up and I give feedback, then I might get rejected. And if I get rejected, I lose the bond with this person. I lose the intimacy with this person. And if that's what you were taught when you were a child, you know, depending on how your relationship was with your caregivers, because our our, our childhood directly reflects our attachment styles and relationships and those attachment styles can come out during sex. And so I think that's where a lot of people, and I, I don't want to say only women, because I'm sure this can happen in other scenarios, but I think a lot of people are afraid to speak up because they're afraid of rejection or afraid of the reaction that they may get. But I can't stress enough how important it is to not fake orgasms, to not fake pleasure because that person may really think that by doing the act in a certain way that really is not pleasurable for you, they may actually indeed think that it's pleasurable. And then the domino effect is, is that it actually feeds their ego even more and they continue yeah. the behavior. You're, you're reinforcing that behavior and that's what we don't want to do. And so I think that's why a lot of women may quote unquote fawn when really it's to keep that intimacy and that connection. Yeah, well, I agree. And, and I think another really important thing here, though, is to focus on real safety concerns, right? Because mm -hmm. one of the elements of sexual narcissism can be aggress aggression um, or uh, retaliation if they feel confronted by their behavior. Um, so if you feel your safety is really uh, at risk, I think it's it's important to come up with a safety plan with somebody that you trust, somebody who's on your side, somebody who gets it and isn't going to encourage you to just stay for the sake of staying, right? It is okay to walk away from a moment. It is okay to yes. walk away from a relationship if you do not feel safe in it. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, really kind of getting real with what is happening here and Am I emotionally safe? Am I physically safe? Am I sexually safe? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then it might be a good opportunity to kind of rethink what bond are you trying to hold on to here? Because mm -hmm. there's sort of the fantasy of what we have or these moments that might feel good. But if those moments are, are couched with all of this danger and risk and feelings of being unsettled or unsafe, I, I might invite people to get a little bit more curious on whether or not there could be something else in their life that brings them more peace and more pleasure. I want to bring up something when you brought up the word punishment. Um, I thought mm -hmm. of there's there was a client that I had a while back, and this has actually happened more than once, where a client was in a relationship with a person who was very narcissistic in the relationship, including with sex. And that person started to feel pressured to do things that they didn't want to do, such as lifestyle, mm -hmm. threesomes, um, engaging in activities that they normally would have never done. And it's not that this person was curious about it. They felt pressured to do these things. And so sometimes that may also look like feeling yeah. pressured in other sexual ways, such as doing these like experimentations with things that you normally would not feel comfortable doing. And just like you said, I think that 
feeling safe and expressing safety, coming up with a safety plan. You have every right to say, I don't want to do this. I'm not comfortable. Even if you're in the middle of an act, you have every single right to stop and disengage at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So true. Um, Caress, where can people learn more about you and about your work if they want to connect with you? Yeah. So um, my main playground is Instagram, but I'm on TikTok and Facebook and all the socials that I need to be on. But you can find me on Instagram at underscore K-E-R-E-S-S-E underscore and on my website at uh, www.therapeutichealingbyreese.com. And come say hi if you share anything or if you see anything. I love to hear from you guys. And on my podcast, Diary of an Empath, where we talk about anything from mental health to relationships to spiritual health and anything to just be a better human. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so grateful to have had this conversation. Yes. Thank you, Kate. Okay. Thanks everyone. See you next week. Thank you for listening to Get Naked with Dr. Kate. Stay connected with me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Kate Balistrary. Everyone has questions and I want to answer as many as I can. So feel free to email your questions to question at getnakedpodcast.com. If you're looking for a free 30-minute consultation with me or someone on my team, visit modernintimacy.com. And don't forget to join our newsletter, Modern Intimacy, on Substack. Let's meet back here next week. A new episode drops every Tuesday. Disclaimer, this podcast is not a substitute for therapy and does not constitute a professional relationship with Dr. Kate Balistrieri or Modern Intimacy. This podcast is strictly for education and entertainment purposes only.